Hello everyone, and as always, welcome back to Strategy Gaming Dojo, where we find, learn, and play one more turn of the great strategy games, and today it's back into Gary Grigsby's War in the East 2. This is our quick start tutorial, and this is part four of four, and this time we'll get into the action or ground phase of the game. Now I'm going to try to be a little more brief this time. I'm going to actually have to go back and redo part three and try to cut some stuff out of it to get it down to an hour. If you're going to do a quick start tutorial, you don't want to put up one episode that's an hour and a half. Uh, the problem with this game is there's so many concepts, I don't want to leave anything out. But by the same token, I mean, again, if you're trying to quick start it, it doesn't make sense to have them that long. So let's try to keep this one to an hour. I say to you, as if you have control over the button, you do not. Uh, but I'm going to try to keep it down to an hour. So let's jump into it. And strangely enough, I'm going to start in the air planning phase because I just kind of want to give you a tip uh, at the start as you're starting uh, your exploration of this game. And that is when it comes to the air war, and I've still got the air planning phase up here, when it comes to the air war, after your turn one or day one bombing of the Soviet airfields, which is kind of how most people play, you've got all of these Soviet Soviet aircraft out here, you have a huge surprise advantage. You get an advantage in the game for your bombing on day one. And you may say, well, how does that work? We have, you know, seven day turns. Well, as you know, in the air planning phase, you can tell it which days to do things. And so on day one, you're going to go out and you're going to bomb all these airfields. Check out my other videos for that. Um, but after that, it is uh, really... I think the way to play is just to do ground support. And so after day one, Luftflotte 1, ground support for Army Group North. Luftflotte 2, ground support for Army Group Center. Luftflotte 4, ground support for Army Group South. That is the vanilla base way I would play the game. Now, as you play the game more, you may decide to do other things. But once you get beyond the first turn, I think this is the way to do it. And there is a button to turn on and off this ground support. And I'll show you. And that's part of kind of the ground war. That's why I'm starting here, is there is a button that lets you actually turn this on or off off even if you've given it the directive so you've told it this is what i, I want you to do Luftwa luftwaffe but if you don't want them to do it on a certain attack uh you can turn that off okay hungarian air command ground support for the hungarian armies romanian air command ground support for the romanian armies this is how i would have it set up starting turn two Okay, so we're going to have those air directives in. I'm not going to do the initial bombing, obviously, because we're going to move beyond that. So we click next phase here. Now, if you had decided uh, that you want to, you can go up here and also activate AI air assist, but it's going to change your orders. Okay, so once you put those in, if you're doing it manually, you execute the air directives. And as you'll see down here, these air directives happen. Uh, if you scoop back or if you slow it down, there's certain uh, choices you can make to slow it down and see every air mission run out here. We're not going to do that, obviously. And you can see the days click by. Now, because I have it on ground support, which happens to our during our ground or action phase, you're going to see no sorties have been run. We're not running any, or the AI is not sending out any missions because to achieve these directives, it would have to wait until we attack or, uh, well, I guess attack or defend, one of the two. That's what ground support does, okay? So now we've done the error execution phase. Uh, logistics happened automatically on turn one. Then we did the air planning. I, when I click this phase, we just did error execution, but you know, one of these things that makes the game a little more complicated, error execution can also happen when you're on the ground here, when you have it on ground support. Now I said there was a button uh, for ground support. And as you see here right now, ground support is on. And if we go over to this button, Toggle ground support on or off. Let's say that you start attacking out here and you think you're losing way too many planes. And you're like, I don't like this ground support or it's not working or whatever the case may be. You can click that off. 
and it goes ground support off. And that's what it's such an important part of the game. They give it their own little, uh, you know, indicator here. So that'll let you know just how important ground support is. Now, what is ground support? Well, what it's going to do is fly out bombers and fighters. I say it, the AI. You're not in individual control of this. You've just given it the big overall directive, right? I want you to do ground support in the north with Luftwaffe 1, in the center with Luftwaffe 2, in the south with Luftwaffe 4. Okay, uh, the game itself, the AI is going to decide how many bombers and how many escort fighters to send out to each individual battle. So let's just get down here on the map. Let's say we took this unit and we attacked these guys here. Okay, it, the game itself, the AI would say, okay, we have a directive that says we want ground support. The ground support has not been turned off. Okay, it's on. So the AI is essentially you've opened the valves for the AI to send out bombers and fighters to escort them to this battle if it thinks it should. Uh, and I'm not privy to that algorithm, but most times it will send some bit of bo bombers and fighters. I guess it depends how many you have, how many are ready, whether the odds are good, if the Soviets have a big air uh, contingent in, uh, in the way. Now, I can tell you in 1941, the Soviet Air Force is crap. You destroy a big chunk of it on day one. But if you don't, if you don't do that day one bombing, you'll destroy a huge chunk of it as it tries to respond to your ground support. And I've actually talked to people that play it that way. They don't even do the big bombing on day one. They allow these crappy uh, Soviet bombers and fighters to survive because they're going to get chewed up by the Luftwaffe anyway uh, as they battle in the skies above your combat. Okay. Let's get on the ground because that's kind of the big air portion of the ground, all right? Um, and let's talk about what we see out here. Well, you see different colors, right? These different colors at the start of the game indicate different armies. So this is 18th Army up here in purple. It's a full army, and we'll talk about the whole command structure. You see armored units in here. So it goes by the NATO symbols. This is infantry. Right, we have headquarters. Um, then we have Panzer divisions, and it's shown by the armor uh, symbol there. You also have motorized divisions, shown by the motorized symbol. Now, this in neon pink, I would say, is Fourth Panzer group. And so the way the Germans uh, set up their army here in the east is they had ground troops in armies. OK, in infantry armies like the 18th or down here in pink, this is the 16th army in green. This is the 9th army. OK, so in the north, they have two armies, the 18th and the 16th, and they have a panzer group uh, right here. Now, the panzer group can have infantry in it, as you see here. Now, usually I will reassign these down to the armies. I just find it easier to do it that way and have all of the motorized uh, and armor divisions all in the panzer group. And then I get the infantry out into these other armies. But we'll talk more about that. Um, and as you can see, they, they have these color coordinations, so you can kind of keep track of them, right? You also have the big headquarters out here. You have some unaffiliated divisions that you can then give commands, and we'll talk more about that. As we move down, you've got 9th Army in green here, and then in the neon green, the game, the developers like to give it a neon color when it's a panzer group. In this neon green, you have, uh, this is 3rd Panzer Group, okay? in the center and then you see a bunch of unaffiliated or at least not in these armies uh, divisions here. Down here is fourth army in blue and then you see neon blue or kind of a neon blue I guess not as quite as neon as these uh, but this is second panzer army under Hans Guderian. Um, okay and then as we move down here uh, you get 
the Sixth Army? Yeah, that's the Sixth Army, the famous Sixth Army that ends up getting trapped at Stalingrad uh, during, uh, in historical terms, hopefully that doesn't happen to you. Well, hopefully you get to Stalingrad, but hopefully you don't get trapped. Uh, and then down here is 17th Army in the green, and then you see in the, in the kind of neon orange here, you have 1st Panzer Group. So 1st Panzer Group, 2nd Panzer Group, 3rd Panzer Group, fourth pan you have four panzer groups you have 18th army 16th army 9th army fourth army okay so you have two armies in in the north two armies in the center uh you have two armies in the south you have one panzer group in the south you have two in the center and one in the north so one two one for the panzer groups and then you have two armies on in each uh theater of action OK, then you also have the Hungarians back here. You have the Slovaks. You have the Romanians. You also have some German troops down here. They're in the gray. That is the 11th Army that starts way down here in the south. Uh, but the vast majority of the rest of they have the grayish background here. The vast majority of this is Romanian troops. OK, so that's kind of how the board sets up. Now, if we look at the individual counters, just what you can see uh, at the start, you can see divisions are 2x. 2x is indicated division. All right. You then see their offensive combat value, 24, and the number of movement points they have, 16. Every hex in the game, depending on the terrain of the hex, what else is in the hex, uh, and the weather has a certain cost to move through it. And we talked about hexes in the first episode, but the basic idea is if you're moving through swamp like this and there's no road, let's turn on the roads. Okay, uh, here. If you're moving through this swamp and there's no roads close, it's going to cost you more points than if you move through swamp with uh, better roads, okay? And it's going to cost, this is going to cost more points than a clear hex like this one with roads. I mean, it, you know, if you played any war game in, in, ever you understand the concept right Ca uh, crossing rivers cost more points and as you can see the default number of points for an infantry division and when i say points i mean movement points is 16 you get 16 each turn then you have core headquarters and that's the triple x Core headquarters command divisions, all right? And we'll talk more about that, but they command divisions. Then you have army headquarters with the four X's, and they command core headquarters, all right? Okay. Then you have, uh, and then it goes all, it keeps going up the chain of command, but we'll talk about the chain of command here in a minute. When you go to your motorized cores here or motorized groups i should call them this is fourth panzer group when you go to fourth panzer group you'll notice the motorized portions of that have 50 movement points all right so headquarters even these headquarters even infantry headquarters can uh, use 50 movement points per turn as a default. Now, as if you run out of fuel or you have less supply or they're in battle and they get fatigued, at the start of a turn, you may actually have less than 50 or less than 16. But those are the two default movement point values. Uh, you know, for infantry, it's 16. Infantry, 16, even if it's in a motorized group, but motorized is 50, armor is 50. OK, now you can click on the stacks and when you click on the stacks, it'll bring this uh, box over here to the right where you can get a closer view of each division. This actually I didn't really mean to do this, but this uh, is a different kind of counter. This is your railroad repair FBD4. All right, you start out with five of these and they're gonna repair your railroads as you move forward. I've talked about this a bunch in my videos, but essentially the Russian gauge of railroad was different 
than the uh, gauge in the rest of Europe. And because of that, the Germans had to go through on these rails and they had to repair, quote unquote, repair them. Uh, in essence, they had to go through and fix their size so that their rail cars could go through on them. Okay, so you will be repairing rail all over. Every hex that you take over, you're going to have to repair the rail because the Soviet rail is a different gauge than the German or Hungarian, for that matter, rail. Uh, and so you got to go through and fix it. You could also have partisans out here or other reasons. Or if the Soviets come back over a hex, they'll damage the rail again and you've got to come out and fix it. So... Fixing rail is a huge part of this game. We will not get that deep into it, but just always keep in mind, this is the button up here that shows you whether the rail is good or not. And we talked about this in a previous video. If it's green, freight can roll over it. If it's yellow, freight can roll over it, but men, meaning reinforcements, cannot. Why would it be yellow? Because it's next to the Soviets. And so you can't put men on rail next to the Soviets. That's why it's in yellow, excuse me. Um, and you can see that anywhere where we're next to the Soviets, it shows up yellow. Um, we don't see any red on here now, but once we move out here, it will be red. These rail hexes will be red where it's Soviet gauge or it's damaged, even if we've already repaired it. Okay. Um, the other thing that can affect movement points are something called delay points. And those are right here. Now we have not fought a battle yet, but when we do, and let's say we attack right here, there's going to be a certain number of delay points that show up in this hex, meaning if you try to leave that hex, it's going to cost you that many extra movement points. The idea there is, is as you move through a hex like that, where there's been a big battle, you may have to take care of casualties. You may have to, you know, move equipment out of the road. You may have to, you know, go over big uh, explosion points or something. You know, it's just going to take you longer to get through that hex if there's been a battle or a series of battles there. The other thing I want to show you about the map that, of course, we've already talked about, but I just want to show you is logistics. And you will see these are where we have our depots. And as you move out here, you're going to want to build depots on rail lines and at major towns. So if we capture Minsk, will want to build a depot there. Now, I'm not going to go deep into logistics, even though logistics is a very important part of this game. Uh, that is just way beyond the scope of a one-hour video. Uh, but the basic idea for depots is they go from level zero, which is what Berlin should be, if we go all the way back to Berlin, Berlin is zero, and they flow out to numbers that are larger, okay? And you're going to want it to flow on rail. And so this rail line, and if we turn on the rail lines, you can see it goes green to green to one. So zero will push out freight to one. Okay, let's take the rail off there. Then ones, these are ones out here, one will push out to two. There's a two, all right? Two will push to three, and then you want your fours out here right on the front lines or as close as you can get them there so that freight is flowing all the way from Berlin out to these level four depots that are going to actually send out trucks to supply your troops, okay? So, again, uh, we're not going to go deep, deep into that, but that's the basic idea. Zero to four at the front on these depots, and you want them to be on rail. Well, they're got to, kind of got to be on um, on rail to start with, really, but you're going to have them in the major towns, and then you're going to have them right out at the front uh, with your troops so that It'll push all the way out there to them. Let's say we took Vilecki Luki. It'll push on this rail all the way out to Vilecki Luki, and then trucks can go out and supply your troops. Trucks are also very important in this game. You do not 
independently control your trucks, but the closer you have your depots to your frontline troops that need supplied, the less trucks you will use, okay? So that's just a very simplistic way of looking at logistics. I just wanted to point that out. Um, fort levels, we've talked about that. Of course, if it's a higher fort level, it's going to be more difficult to attack. It's got a better defensive value. The other thing I want to talk about with counters is if you hit the Z key, which I just did, you will see that this goes to an equal sign. Now what's this showing you? Well, let's look at this division right here. It, when I just hit it again, so right now it's a dash, 26 offensive combat value, 16 movement points, okay? I'm gonna hit Z. Now it's 26 equal 26, okay? What does this mean? This means the combat value offensively is 26 and the combat value on defense is 26, okay? So when you hit the Z key, you can see the defensive value in place of the movement points. And I just shifted them again. All right. And you may say, well, they're exactly the same. So, they, you know, they'll never be different. Wrong. It all depends on how defensive the hex is where they are. It could depend on the equipment they have. Let's say they have more anti-tank stuff. Maybe they're better on defense. And you can see here, for instance, this division, 24 on offense, 61 on defense all right this also depends on a fort if they're in a fort that can help their defensive value if they're in a you know better defensive terrain like heavy woods that could help their defensive value so what you see here and this is just a base raw score you can see the Soviets as well as you get detection levels on them. So the more that you fight them, the more that you fly recon over them, you will get a better idea of what their offensive. And for the Soviets, it always shows you their offensive ability and their defensive ability. It does not show you their movement points because there's really no way for you to know that, right? Um, even if you have recon, you don't know how much fuel they have. You don't know how tired the troops are, etc. So it always shows you the equal sign, which means offensive, defensive. For you, offensive, defensive, but if you hit Z again, then you see the movement points, all right? So you can, you know, kind of flip back and forth depending on whether you're on offense. Now, early in the game, you're completely on the offense, right? So you're probably just going to want to see movement points. Um, what's a gauge here just to think about? Well, early on, the Soviet defense defenders have like a, you know, we're seeing it one question mark one. That's just because we have no idea really what it is. Even these, we really don't know what their defensive value is. Usually the Soviets early on are going to range from like one to five on defensiveness. As you can see, just an infantry division, you have a 26. That's why you could just mow these things over. Um, it's like your Panzer division right here. So this is, if we look at it, 8th Panzer division. Now that's not the one I have selected. You click again, whoops, you click again, and you can see over here, it flips you down to the other one. Or if you double click it, God, did I just do that again? Yeah, wrong hex, buddy. If you double click it, it selects both, okay? So one click, Gets, moves you back and forth between whatever two counters are in that hex. If you double click them, you select both. And also, I'll tell you, if you double click, uh, hold on. Actually, if you pick another hex, this shows you the combined offensive strength of both, which is 76. If you just click on one or the other, it'll show you them independently so right now this is lit up it's showing us 48 right if we click to the other one it's 28 on the offense uh but if we double click them it's 76. i'm no mathematician but that adds up to 76 right uh so that's kind of how to look at those hexes one thing to keep in mind you can never have three counter more than i'm sorry more than three counters of any type in a hex and so it doesn't matter if they're headquarters motorized infantry security units these are just kind of these are infantry units they just call them security units uh you know for historical flavor but essentially they're just weaker 
infantry units, right? Uh, and you kind of use these to put them into towns as a garrison. But anyway, we won't go down that road. Uh, the basic idea is that... Um, Oh, I lost my train of thought. Uh, I went down this road and now I lost my train of thought. Oh, no matter what counter type you have, you cannot have more than three in any one hex. All right. So if you try to move a fourth one in there, the game will not allow you to do it. All right. So let's talk about an individual infantry division and i'm just going to pick this one here oh it just so happens to be first infantry division it's in first core that's its commander and when you look over here to the right the command of whatever you're clicked on will show directly below it and it will show you how many hexes that command is away in this case it's one and how many hexes you have before you would be out of command range, which is five. And that's how divisions work in this game, all right? And let's get the pencil out and talk about the command structure. Um, let's start at the very, very bottom, which is elements. You have a table of elements or equipment some people like to call it equipment i think it's really table of elements in each division t-o-e table of elements these are all the individual things that make up this division and you may say can i not see that wrong you can see it and let's right click on that and you see here elements okay and this will tell you everything that makes up the first infantry division, all right? So I just right clicked on that. And when you right click it, it brings up what I like to call the back of the card. This is like, you know, just think of these count, like they were really counters on the map. You're sitting at your uh, buddy, in your buddy's basement playing a board game. Um, and this would be the back of the counter or the back of the baseball card, right? And this tells you everything about this division. 28 on the offense, 16 movement points. It's an infantry division. I'll talk about these two things uh, in a minute. In a minute, we'll get to that, okay? It's made up of 16,946 men total, 197 artillery or gun pieces, and zero AFBs or armored fighting vehicles. It also gives you a one loss record. It really is like a baseball card. It gives you wins and losses uh, for this particular division for every battle it's been in. Uh, supply de details, merge unit. You can also pay uh, APs to motorize this unit. If you want it to get 50 movement points so you can move it faster, you can motorize it, meaning it's going to assign 1,425 trucks to this division. You would pay three AP points, and now it can move 50. Uh, it may be something you consider on the first few turns of the game because quickness matters. Uh, how fast you can get out here and surround Soviet troops matters. But let's go down the rest of the card here, okay? Um, actually, I'll start right over here. Uh, we've already talked about this. Two X's means it's a division. This is the insignia for the division historically. You can also click up here on this W. What is this? They call it Wikipedia, and this will give you the entire historical uh, journey of this division through the war. All right, it tells you it was in 18th Army. It tried to go out to Leningrad. Well, that makes sense because we're up here in 18th Army. I mean, they they did this historically, certainly at the start. And so that will tell you all the information about it that you would ever want to know. This is fatigue. It's a teardrop. I guess we're crying the more we march. This runs from 0 to 100. Uh, the closer you are to 100, the less effective your troops would be. Uh, the closer you are to zero, the closer to their base value you, they will be. This is called combat prep points. This is new for this game. Essentially, combat prep points make your attacks more lethal, okay? And they just make your troops better in general. This also runs from zero to 100, but this one you actually want to be at 100. So zero is the worst, 100 is the best. For fatigue, it's just the opposite. Zero is the best, 100 is the worst. So combat prep points, how do you get these? The longer you sit in a hex, the more combat prep points you will accrue, 
okay? And this was an idea that they just put into this game to make it essentially the more you kind of sit around and plan, the better your attacks are going to be. So if you wait three weeks to do an attack, they're assuming that your prep is better. Combat prep points. Get it? All right. Uh, combat value. Offensive value. Now, this breaks it down into tenths right here. Uh, but, you know, it's 28 on the offense. But if we hit Z, let's get off that. And we hit Z. And we hit Z. Did I just hit Z? Yeah, there it is. Equal. Equal sign. Um, you could also do figure that out because it shows you the defensive value up to tenths. So offensive, defensive, T-O-E, table of elements. The first number is how, mi how much on a scale of 0 to 100 of these elements that make up a German division you have that are ready. This is ready, okay? And so you have 99% ready. You also have 99% of the recommended table of elements. So every division has a template and that template changes as the game goes on. So they've historically researched it. And let's say in 1944, there are more mortars or less mortars of these 81 millimeter mortars in a German division. That will change your template. And these numbers are based off the template. Right now, you have 99% total just sitting in the division of your recommended TOE or template, and you have 99% that are ready. And so that's what those two numbers are. And if you click on that, this shows you what you have in your division, and this shows you what the template is. And so you can see here, the template is called 1941, 41 first and second wave infantry division. What should they have in them? Okay, they should have two light armored cars. Well, we do have two, so we're at 100%. They should have 324 rifle squads, which are generally six to eight men, 324. We do have 324, but as we get into battles, this will change because this is what you actually have in the unit. As you can see at the start, we're light about three artillery guns. Now, one thing that kind of confuses people sometimes is they say, wait a minute, um, you know, uh, I've got this counter out here. It's one entity, right? It is sort of, but it's really just a container of your elements, uh, right? And so you have six, you should have six infantry guns, heavy infantry guns. We do have six, but let's say you get in a battle after that, you may only have four, right? And this would click down to, boy, I, I said I'm no mathematician, 66%, let's say, okay? Because you lost part of that and it will constantly update these of what you actually have in the division. Now, because of production, you know, you can get reinforcements if you're close to a depot, if you have these things on refit, which we'll talk about as we go along here. But as you can see, we're about 30 men short of the ideal or template uh, division as well. I'm not going to go into the other stuff, but this will show you how the template changes when it upgrades uh, the next time. All right. But the game is constantly trying to stuff these things full to the template. Just something to always keep in mind. So that's on the back of the card. The TOE, I look at this all of the time. It will give you a real general sense of how well your division uh, is stocked up, how well it's, uh, you know, or how much it's degraded, I guess. Max TOE, 100%. You can change this. Let's say that you have, play, in certain places, you have troops that are behind the line, or you just don't need all of this stuff, but you do need it elsewhere. You could change this to 80%, and then this is only going to try to go to 80%. All right? High headquarters, or this is actually its direct headquarters, is First Corps. And you can see that? First Corps, okay? It is overall part of Army Group North. This is the next higher headquarters is, well, not that's not true, actually. It, this is two above it. This is the overall, I call this the overall headquarters. This is really the theater it's in, Army Group North. Morale, incredibly important part of this game. 
The first number is the actual morale of this division. The second number is the national morale, 75 for the Germans. This is much higher than it is for the Soviets. I think the Soviets started either 55 or 60%. Morale is the number one indicator of, of how your troops are, and it will have a huge, huge uh, impact on the results of battle. Your individual division's morale will always try to gravitate back to the national morale. However, if you win a bunch of battles and stuff, it will go up. I mean, this could go up to 90, 95%. You kind of turn it into a super division the more battles you win. But eventually, if you're not fighting battles, it'll try to go here. Nation Germany, we get it. Supply, I'm not really going to talk about here. Construction value is important for how quickly it will build fort levels. Okay, and I'll uh, again direct you either to the rule book or to my other tutorials. But the longer when something sits in a hex, I say something, a division sits in a hex for a turn and doesn't move or get in a battle, this construction value will start to build a fort level. It's a man-made fort level. It doesn't necessarily mean they're building a brick and mortar fort, right? It could just be uh, booby traps and stuff, but uh, that's what, you know, fort level is kind of a big concept. Uh, transport costs, this is how much it, do it costs to go over rail. We're not going to go over that. Vehicles need, this is how many vehicles they need to move the division. It is right now non-motorized, although you could motorize it motorize it and its supply status is in supply then we go over here to the elements right we talked about that the toe table of elements you can also go look at each individual element right if you want to know what these armored cars are all about it gives you all of the stats their range and everything else now this is a big operational level game right and so whether an armored car has a range of 1500 quite frankly, <clears throat> isn't very important for your purposes. The game takes all of this into account, but you're just going to be attacking, you know, division against division or core against core. You don't really have to worry about that stuff, but I do find it very interesting, especially if you're just interested in the history of the war, the different equipment that was used, uh, you can do that. So anyway, this is the back of the card. Let's go back to the front of the card and let's talk about the command structure here. So we have first ID and I had started to trace this out and I said T-O-E. Okay, T-O-E. Table of elements. So all of those elements make up a division. This, in this case, the first uh, infantry division. The first infantry division at the start is commanded by first corps. So the next level up is a corps. And this is your first headquarters unit. Now headquarters units do not attack or defend. They, they provide command, okay? And it's, it's important for a lot of different reasons. But when you see this one of five, you're always gonna wanna keep first infantry division within five hexes of its core headquarters. Now you can change its head core headquarters if you need to. Let's say it comes all the way down here and you're like, crap, it's closer to 16th Army. I'm gonna put it in one of the core headquarters of 16th Army. You can do that. You can change them uh, and it doesn't cost you anything. The only thing it will do is give it a slight penalty uh, when the turn that you change it over. All right, so you can always change these things, uh, their commands, if you want or need to. So the first command are core headquarters, okay? Done. Let's go back and look at a core headquarter. So you're always going to want to turn this on. And what is this? This is the command chain. And what you're seeing here is when I click on this, it's showing the other divisions that are in this core in yellow. And it's showing its core headquarters with a line, an orange line back to it here. And here you can see there's first core. All right. Now there's another headquarters here. We'll talk about that in a second. This is the direct commander for first core, but we'll get there. So the division 
goes back to First Corps for its command. And you can see this is a headquarters division. It cannot attack. It cannot defend. It is just a headquarters, all right? And it's got the three X's here, all right? And then it is set up. The counter is set up very much the same way. It shows you its direct com commander, which is 18th Army. Now, in this case, it is in the same hex as 18th Army, so it shows you a zero. It needs to be within 15 hexes of 18th Army to be within command, to be within 18th Army's command radius. And so, as you can see, a division has to be within five. A corps headquarters has to be within 15 of the army. So it's bigger, as you may suspect, right? A big, eight, a big army headquarters is going to have, you know, more communications and everything else. So that can be 15. All right, so now we're on First Corps here. We've got it lit up, and you can see through these blue lines the divisions under its command. And that would be 11th ID is under one Corps, First ID that we've been talking about is under First Corps, and 21st ID is under First Corps. All right, so all of these guys are in command, and this is their command headquarters. Now, let's go down the, the counter here. This is uh, how many overall movement points they have. Now, there's too many. There are too many. Wow, that was Freudian. There are two different movement types in this game. There's either moving on the ground, and those are, if we hit Z here, these movement points right here. That's if it's moving on the ground. Each unit also gets what they call strategic movement points, which means when you move by rail. But if you move by rail, you can move less on the ground that same turn, or vice versa. If you move on the ground, you can move less by rail during that same turn. They work together, and that's what this is. It's kind of your strategic movement points. These are your ground movement points. You see here in turn one, they gave us zero. We can't move by rail this turn. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, on the ID card here, I guess I didn't really go over this, and let's do this before we move on from divisions. This is how many men, how many artillery or gun pieces, how many AFVs. It's the same as when we right-clicked and we look right up here. It's the same numbers, right? Number of men, number of guns or artillery, and how many AFVs. This button up here is ready. OK, now the vast majority of time uh, you're going to want these to be on ready. That means they can move and they can fight uh, and they're ready to go. If you click on that, this is refit. What does this mean? This means you're giving priority for this division to get replacements. When something is on refit, uh, essentially you're calling for extra reinforcements and getting priority to this division. If we go down here and click on this division, it's on ready. If we come up here, this is on refit. Perfect. If you need more stuff in here. So let's say we get in a big battle. We lose, I don't know, 4,000 men. And this says 12,946 next time. We may want to put this on refit so it gets priority for reinforcements. Be just a tip here. You cannot, well, you can click the refi, refit, ref, the refit button. You can click on it, but if you're next to Soviet troops, it will not refit. It's as if it's not on refit. You've got to be back behind the line. So think of this as something you may want to do. You know, this gets in a bunch of battles. They're tired. You've got fatigue points building up. You've got no combat prep. You may pull it back behind the line for a turn or two, put it on refit, let it rest, and also let it rebuild. And so that's what this button is. Then you could also put it on reserve. And you may say, well, reserve is kind of like refit, right? You're just putting it back here on reserve, sort of. Reserve has a special rule around it that if you have a unit that's kind of behind the lines and you put it on reserve, it can help in battles if it's general, if it's core headquarters, wants to put it in the battle. So you can really use this on the defense. And how do you do it? Well, you put it on reserve. You take it off the line at least one hex. You put it on reserve. Um, 
and it can then help defensively within six hexes. So let's just count one, two, three, four, five, six. If this division got attacked, the core headquarters could have this help in this battle on the defense. Meanwhile, on the offense, it can help in battles within three hexes. So let's say, I don't know, one, two, three. Let's say we get in a battle, well, that's actually only two. Let's say here, three, one, two, three. Let's say up here there's a battle and you've got this on reserve off the line. It cannot be next to Soviet troops. If the, there's an offensive battle here, the core headquarters can put it in that battle automatically. So reserve is very powerful, but especially on the defense. You're really going to use it on the defense uh, to have something sit back here behind the line, behind a line, and as you're being attacked, it can be put into those battles. Okay, so that's the next one. Uh, reserve, ready refit reserve there is another one called static if you're going to have something uh you know that just sits somewhere maybe one of these security forces you could put it on static it will use less supply okay then what do we see below that combat prep points we talked about that uh the teardrops for fatigue then you have food or uh somebody was telling me it's a uh, like uh bites uh but now i'm just going to do it the way i do it uh this is food, all right? We've got 130% of our need. This is fuel, 121%. This is ammunition. Food, fuel, and ammunition. Uh, you know, bites, bullets, uh, uh, no, uh, gas, bullets, I don't know. Food, fuel, ammunition, 138%. This obviously will dynamically update as you use more of that. As your troops move out here, they're going to get stretched for supply and their food percentage will go down. If it gets low enough, it really starts to degrade your troops. Uh, but that's really logistics. That's for a much more in-depth tutorial, okay? But this is what it stands for in the front of the card. All right. Let's get back to the headquarters and you may be saying, well, how do I get this nice, you know, blue lines out to here? Orange shows you the command. Now the counter is underneath uh, here. Oh, actually it's not. It's now moved to the top because I selected it. If you select 18th Army, uh, it moves to the top. All right. So this is the command, first corps, right? Then it, you see the other core headquarters of this army show up in yellow. So anything in yellow is at the equal command level. Anything at blue is what is being commanded. And anything in orange is a higher command level. All right. How do you get that on? Well, let's go to admin, look at hot buttons. And frankly, I forget toggle uh, boy i probably should have looked this up before as you can see you can uh here it is shift z okay well i've given you two this time z changes to show you offense and defense shift z turns on and off these markers that i've got here so let's get on this again as you can see it goes back to the orange if i hit shift z it'll take that orange line off okay Whoops. And if I hit shift Z again, if I hit there, it puts them back on. So shift Z will show you those commands. All right. We got to hurry here. Uh, running out of time. Uh, core headquarters are set up, you know, kind of the front of the counter, very similarly, food, fuel, how many men are actually in the core headquarters. Now they have men artillery and AFVs, but they don't attack or defend, right? They, they just kind of sit here at the headquarters to defend the headquarters. All right, let's, can, let's very quickly try to wrap up the command structure. Down here, TOE makes up a division. Divisions, you will generally have three or four divisions in a core all right you will have three or four cores in an army you will have generally speaking two armies in an army group and then at the very top 
you have OKH. So you have OKH, which is your big head overall command. Let's just go find that, all right? So OKH is right here. You see all the X's. There is OKH. It's under Holder to begin with. And if you float over here, you see Franz Holder and you see average 4.4. What the heck's that mean? That's not his grade point average. Uh, otherwise, wow, he's on the honor roll. If you click on him, you can see the general here. Now, when you're looking at generals, what's important? Political, you don't care so much about other than it costs more APs to replace them. Uh, in this case, it's going to cost 30 because he's at a high command. But uh, if a guy's more political, it costs more to replace him, essentially. Get a nice picture here. Some of these guys have really nice monocles. Uh, I've actually worn a monocle on a live stream. Don't hold that against me. Then you see morale initiative admin. Okay, morale probably being the most important. These run on a scale of one to nine. So you can see that Halder's actually not very good to be such a you know big time general here at OKH. Four is not very good. Initiative has to do with how good your troops fight uh, and you know surprise elements, things like that. Admin comes down to logistics and supply. He's excellent at this he's as good as you can get then you have a mech score and an infantry score the, if you're having a guy lead infantry obviously you want this infantry score to be higher it goes into all kinds of calculations for combat okay mech you want him leading a motorized or an armor unit. Here's some armors, the panzer divisions. You want somebody good at mech leading those. If you want to change your general, you can do it. It would cost you 30 AP. We don't even have enough to do it. If we go here, must have 30 admin points. But when you do that, it will bring up a menu of generals um, that you can pick. All right, so we're on OKH here. Let's hit Shift Z again. Shift Z, Shift Z. Okay, you can see what's directly under OKH here. And some, so what are these are our army group center. Okay, and so if we go back to our, our list here, we have OKH. We just looked at that. All right. And I'm going to put a 90 next to this because that is its command range. It can command headquarters within, I mean, 90 hexes is a long ways, within 90. Underneath that, we already talked about this, are the army groups, and you have three of them at the start. Now, this can also directly command things. So, like 11th Army is directly up into OKH. You really don't want it to be set up this way, uh, because the more levels of command you have, the more advantageous it is. But that's probably beyond the scope here. Just know you want it to go through the normal chain of command. So OKH goes to Army Group here. That is 45 hexes for the command radius. And you have Army Group North. Uh, let's forget about Army Group. North, Center, and South. And we've looked at that. So you have three of these commands. Let's get off here. Let's go back. Army group um, north. Where is that? Well, let's see. We've got a bunch of X's there. Let's go and look and see where our army group north is. There's a bunch of X's. And there it is. Army group north. So this, OKH, you can see the blue line coming down here because it commands directly army group north, right? And you see the 90 here. Army Group North needs to be within 90 of OKH to be within command. Right now, it's three hexes away, three of 90, all right? Um, I'm not gonna go into more of this other than to say the command, this number here is very important. This is how many command points it can command uh, without penalty, 108 points. Right now, it's commanding 62, so it's good. It's within that command point range. How does that work? Every division that is commanded underneath it, even if not directly, even if it's just, you know, if it goes division to core to army to army group, eventually every division underneath this in the chain of command is worth two points. So in this case, we're commanding 
through all of these command structures, 36 divisions are reporting up here. If we go to Army Group South, which is way down here, there's Army Group South, it's commanding 95 points, all right? So German divisions are worth two points to command. If it commands something that's not German, so let's say Hungarian or Romanian or Finnish, it costs three points. That's why it's an odd number here. It's commanding some things that aren't German, all right? So going back here, we've gone OKH, we've gone Army Group, and you've got three of those, uh, North, Center, South. Then you've got armies, and we've already talked about it. Up here under Army Group North, we've got 18th Army, we've got 16th Army, and we've got 4th Panzer Group. The motorized work just the same way through the chain of command. They all report to Army Group North. So you've got the Army, all right? So we've got 90 is the command range here, 45, and then we talked about it, 15 for the Army. Underneath that are the core headquarters, right? Core headquarters down to divisions, down to your table of elements or the elements that make up a division. Uh, a division has to be within five of its core to get command support from the core, all right? So let's go out here and look at a core as I try to get this in under an hour. This first core, let's go back to this, okay? It says six of nine here. It could command up to nine command points. Right now, it's commanding three German divisions. So it's worth six, that's perfect, that's good. It's uh, it's within you know zero of 15 because it uh, reports directly up to 18th Army. And if we click on 18th Army, you can see its commands. The blue lines run out to its core headquarters. The other core headquarters uh, show up. Oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. The blue lines run out to the core headquarters. In yellow, you see it's equal footing the, army head, the other army headquarters or core headquarters that go directly to OKH. It's on the same level of command, essentially, if it's in yellow. And then it traces back to orange its overall, its head command, which is Army Group North. Army Group North has a 45 radius. It's within nine hexes of it. To finish up here, but it's probably maybe the most important concept in the game, uh, at least from a commands perspective, I'm going to talk about support units very quickly. And what are support units? This is a divisional and core level game. Now you go down to elements, right, that are in the containers here. You go down to elements, but essentially what's represented on the map are divisions divisions they report back to cores cores to armies armies to army groups okay but really you're moving divisions however on the eastern front and just in world war ii and all warfare in general there are smaller groups battalions regiments right that maybe do more specialized things so you maybe have an anti-tank regiment now Keep this in mind in your table of elements on the 269th Infantry Division, you do have anti-tank guns. So it's not like these things are just helpless against tanks, but these are all just part of the division. It's just part of the elements that make up the division. There are also specialized it, you know, units that that's all they do. They're anti-tank in, in the German sense or in the German case, they're called Panzerjäger battalions or regiments. Or, or they could be companies, I guess. But on that level uh, of size, they're not big enough to be represented on the map. So what did the developers do? Because if you represented all of that stuff on the map, these specialized units running around, you wouldn't even be able to see the map. And so what they decided to do is allow those things to be held within the containers, whether they're held at the divisional level, 
the core level, the army or the army group level. All right. And I do a whole video about this, but I just want to give you the basic concept, which is this divisions can get these support units. They can attach directly up to three of them. And here you see assigned support units. All right. So think of support units as being uh, specialized smaller groupings than divisions that you can attach directly to the containers that make up divisions or cores or armies for that matter, but we'll talk about that in a minute, assign support units. And if you click on that, you can see the ones that we could attach directly to this division. Now, generally speaking, Really, there are only a few that you can attach directly to the divisions. Most of these are held at the core level, okay? Let's continue for a second, though. What are the different types? You could have, there's some motorized brigades. Okay, I get, did I say brigade? I don't know. I think I said battalions, companies, and regiments. Also brigades. Just, it's smaller than a division, right? anti-aircraft let's say if you really think this thing is going to get bombed a lot or whatever you may want to put a specialized anti-aircraft battalion or company in here to shoot back and you could do that here it just gives us extra anti-aircraft Panzer Jaegers these are anti-tank guns now it says uh, artillery here but I whoops when I clicked on it it just attached it directly to this division these are engineers. So basically these are made up of anti-aircraft, anti-tank. Sometimes they can be ski battalions. They may be some kind of motorized battalion. Artillery shows up here if you want extra artillery. Now, why or why not would you attach these directly to the divisions? Well, I'm going to give you a very quick synopsis, but essentially if you attach it directly to the division, it fights only with that division, the support unit. All right. And if we click on this again and go here and we go to assigned, you can see the one I just assigned to it. So these are the support units that are now in this container we call a division. So we put the Panzer Jaeger Battalion in here, they'll fight with it. What's the asterisk? That means you can't move it again. You can only move these one time a turn. Now next turn, we could move this, uh, but I'm not gonna go into all that. Essentially though, you can only do three directly to a division. And it means that they will fight only with this division in the battles it's in, and they are automatically committed to the battle. Meaning if, the, if this gets into a battle, this is going to take the field, okay? What's the difference there? Well, the way most people do it in this game, and certainly I do, is do it at the core level. So let's actually go back to first core. We've been talking about that one. Let's right click on that. And as you see here, we're on the assign tab. That is the support units that you have in this, or in this container that we call the core headquarters, okay? What's the advantage and disadvantage of having these at the core level? The advantage is this will uh, commit them to battle in any battle that it, any of the divisions it commands are in, or at least it will do a dice roll to do so. Your general decides whether to commit the support units or not, um, but the advantage is it, these support units could show up in a battle for this division, this division, or this division. Um, so all three of them, not just the individual division. And that's maybe why you would want to have them at the core level, because it could, it could help anybody in the core, right? But your general will decide that, the AI will, and it will have to pass a dice roll. So the better your general, the more likely it is that these support units get pushed out into these battles. And only if these divisions are within command range. And that's why it's so important to keep these within five of the core headquarters, okay? So what is the, you can see we've already started the game with support units here, all right? So you see assigned. 
these are the three divisions that are in this core up here. Well, those aren't support units. I don't really know why they put this on the screen, but they did. Uh, these are just the divisions it commands. Then this has five artillery battalions that are sitting at the core headquarters, right? And it's kind of, you know, like historically happened. Artillery sat kind of back near the headquarters and then it could fire to help any of these divisions. So these are back here. Your general can decide whether to uh, put them into battle. Then you have something called Stug battalions. A Stug is uh, kind of a moving gun. Uh, it's not a tank because it doesn't really have that kind of armor, but it, it's got the gun like a tank engineers which help you dig in and build fort levels they can also help you take down enemy fort levels so if you're going to be attacking into fort levels or into cities or something like that you may want to have engineers about and then construction battalions which also help you build up fort levels uh we were, we're not going to go into that but these are all already assigned to first core OK, we can also move up and see the ones that are assigned to 18th Army. Now, these support units can be pulled down or pushed up. But again, I'm going to leave that for my other tutorials. But if you want to go now, that's up to Army Group North. We don't want to go that far. Let's go back down to First Corps. And let's say we don't like the mix of what we have here. We want other things. Let's go to assigned support units. You will see all of the ones that are above, that are contained in containers above first core in the chain of command. So you'll see the ones in 18th Army, Army Group North, OKH. Now there's not really a good reason to leave them up at OKH or Army Group North uh, because they're probably not going to really be used, right? You want to get them down to the core level where they will really be used. And I always recommend three artillery, okay? I recommend three anti-aircraft. Now, we don't see any anti-aircraft here, so we want to put some in here. One thing to keep in mind is mixed flak in this game also has the 88 millimeter gun, which is also anti-tank. So if you're going to be running it, now you think of this as against airplanes, right? But if it's mixed flak, it also is anti-tank. I always like to have one of these at every core headquarters and then two other flak battalions to keep the Air for the Soviet Air Force off of you. I like to have two construction battalions. Then you have rockets, rockets, red glare. Oh, say, can you see? Heavy Werfer battalion. These are rockets. Werfers are, uh, those are those scary things that you see in World War II videos. But you can put these down at the core level and they will be, assuming your general's good enough, committed to battles that everything in the core is and you have a ton of these support units so don't be shy uh, if we go down to let's just go down to a panzer core or uh, yeah here's a this is in second panzer group 12th core let's see you can see how many support units have already been assigned now if you look at my support units video I usually recommend having these all go up the chain of command and then I pull them back down where I want them, but I'll save that for another time. For now, I will leave you by saying this. As simple as this may sound, if you click on a unit and you want to attack, if you don't push anything and you just float over this, this is a hasty attack. It costs less movement points, but it does less damage. So a hasty attack, as you may imagine, you know, doesn't take as much prep, so it doesn't cost you as many movement points, but it does a lot less damage. They're like probing attacks. If you hold down the shift key, you get this thing that looks like an explosion. That is a prepared attack. That costs more movement points, but it does more damage. It is what you would consider a, a more conventional, a, a general attack. This icon where I'm pressing down nothing and just ho hovering is more like a recon attack. You can also do it with armor early on and just push weak units aside. Uh, but be careful because if you run into the wrong thing and you just send out a little group, it's going to get pounded. All right. So let's do, let's hold shift over here, over this. Actually, let's do it over this unit. This would be a prepared attack on these 
uh, units right here, these Soviet units. Let's say you want to bring more divisions into the attack. You would go and then hover over this. And as you can see on the right-hand side, as you hover, uh, keep holding the shift key down. But as you do that, things go into purple as they're brought into the attack. Now I've hovered over this one, and now there's three of them. Now I let go of the shift key, and I can come over here. I could take them out or put them back into the attack as I want to. Let's do all three, though. So press the shift key again, and now let's hit that unit, and you see all of the air power come here because we had ground support on, and then you saw the aftermath of the battle as we absolutely routed them. Shoot, I kind of wanted to see all that. Ooh, let's do it movement points. That costs three movement points for this unit, three and three. Let's attack this with these three divisions, and then let me hit pause here. You can see all of the air power we're sending here, uh, or is that the Soviets? I think it's the Soviets in red. No, it's the Soviets in green. You can see how many planes they lost as we just chew up their air force. Now, we lost nine fighters, but they lost like 160 planes. They also lost 184 men and two artillery pieces. Okay, let's let that keep going. And it surrendered. All right, this was the battle odds. This was who was in the battle, first corps. What is this asterisk? Well, it was two different corps in this battle, so we got a penalty. You wanna attack with light corps if you can, or the divisions in the same corps if you can. Since this was in a different corps, we got a penalty of 6%, but you see their combat value. You see the support units that were brought into the ba battle. Uh, you see what happened in the battle. You see which Soviets, which generals on both sides were here. The fort levels, it shows you a lot of different stuff. But anyway, uh, I've got videos on all that too. <laughs> enjoy, enjoy. Hopefully this has been very helpful for you. I tried to keep it as short as I could, guys, with trying to give you, you know, enough to get really going. So anyway, this has been Strategy Gaming Dojo. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'll talk to you next time. Have a great one.